Hey everybody, welcome to the live stream. This is the Watches with Dennis channel, which you probably could tell by the fact that that's the name of the channel. Uh, today we are actually going to go over luxury quartz, which is not something I have a lot of expertise in, uh, or really any expertise in, but there's been some demand for that. And so I thought there wasn't a lot of really good watch topics, in my opinion, to cover today. And so I got, went ahead over the last few days, uh, kind of farmed our uh, Discord server to get ideas on brands to cover, did some uh, Google searching to figure out what some other major recommendations are. There aren't, I guess it kind of depends how we define uh, luxury, but there aren't a lot of major players in the space, but that will be the subject of today's video. So in terms of just sort of catching up on what's been going on with the channel and watch related stuff this week, like I often do while people go ahead and connect uh, during the live portion. Um, again, there weren't any real major announcements that I thought were particularly noteworthy. I didn't have any like first thought videos this week. I think the only thing I, I've done is some remixes of some of some reviews. But speaking of reviews, I am I'm doing a new project. It's a, a little project, but it's I've, I've been working over the last few days because there's actually more content than I realized. And so I decided I wanted to go ahead and put my uh, reviews on a website. So I thought, you know, the problem with reviews is sometimes you'd rather if you're me, sometimes you'd rather read them than uh, than watch the video. Uh, I don't do a lot of still photography of watches. Uh, the best I do is like grab my cell phone or occasionally the camera I use to record on. Um, like this is obviously I'm using a webcam right now, but I actually have a camera that I record like my pre-recorded videos on because it's got like it can do 4K and stuff. So so anyway, but that's actually a still photo camera it just happens to do video. So sometimes I'll shoot watches, but I don't, I have no photography background. I've never seriously done it as a hobby either. So my bottom line is my photos are crap. That's my point. But uh, I do think that it's helpful to be able to basically search essentially the transcript of the video. Uh, and a lot of times when I'm researching watches, I would rather be able to read certain things because if I want to go back and pull some stuff up, uh, it's easier textually than it is to go back and find a, a relevant clip or bookmark in a video. So over the last couple of days, I have been in the process of migrating my video reviews into written format uh, and, you know, including a few photos of the watch. I always do have a few photos of every watch, even if I've gotten rid of it. And uh, also, of course, you know, embedding the video review where the footage is a lot better than my photos. Uh, now, the plus side is it shouldn't be that slow of a process because on every review I have done, I always script it. So I actually like load word and I write the review, I actually write it. I, a lot of my other stuff I don't like first thoughts. I just uh, because especially I don't usually shoot myself in, in footage. I actually just like load Audacity, which is an audio recording program. And I just uh, almost free form thought it and then I go back and I edit it all down. So a first thought video that's five minutes long normally is about 15 to 20 minutes of recording. And then I just cut down all of the stuff where I'm tripping over my words or I don't know if I have to relook up what the lug width is or something like that. So I have them all written. The problem is I don't remember how many reviews I'd done because uh, I've only had this channel for a couple of years now, but apparently I've done more reviews than I remembered. So it's just sort of slow going because I need to read the transcript or essentially what I wrote originally. Uh, some of the stuff is is that I write is designed for me to say things that only make sense on video. So I edit it down. Sometimes I've had more time with the watch since then. So I've revised my written review is different than the video review a little bit. I don't I don't sub significantly make the changes uh, to the content. But anyway, so that's been my watch project. So while you haven't really seen any new videos coming out, I have been working on something. I'm hoping to probably get that wrapped up within the week. I think for most of the viewers, you won't care about it. But um, I figured it's a pretty low effort way to further connect people to the videos who might be searching for watch reviews and provide a written format for those that do favor that. And then, you know, I've got the embed, so it may drive traffic to the channel. I don't know. I'm not really very good at driving traffic. So we will find out if that makes much of a difference. But that has been my my watch project. Uh, for today. Now, uh, a couple other things related to the channel, uh, like I always like to try and plug during the live streams. If you want to further support the channel, watching is the best way you can support. But if you want to further support the channel, I do have a membership level, only one. It's the 99, 99 cent club because it's 99 cents a month. So I have that. 
Another thing is a couple of weekends ago, I launched a Discord server. Now, initially, I launched that only with the 99 cent club members. However, that's not going to get enough robust discussion in my view. So they have a channel where they can talk like 99 cent club members can talk, talk to each other, but the entire discord is freely available now. So I have opened that fully up. I have a link in the live chat. That link should be good for the next seven days, uh, including today, the day of the live stream. So if you're watching pre-recorded, if the link doesn't work anymore, you can always email me. Uh, my email is on YouTube and uh, I can get you a new link because it's, I think I have to do some stuff if I don't want an ex expiration link. I just grabbed this real quick. So anyway, link in the live chat, uh, Discord, I love Discord. So uh, if you are intimidated by Discord, I know some people have never used it before and they're kind of like, I don't know, about, you know, how hard is it going to be to learn? Discord is super easy to use. It's um, one of my podcast co-hosts over on Pinball was super reluctant to get involved with Discord. And then he finally installed it on his phone and found out that it in reality, signing up is like the hardest thing. After that, it's really intuitive software. It's basically portable forum software where you use that same program to access a whole bunch of stuff. And I know there are other discords on watches. I can give you recommendations on other discords, like if you're into other hobbies too, but they're pretty easy to find. Also, you can connect that to YouTube. You can connect it to Twitch because uh, sometimes like how I have that extra channel for the 99 cent club, there are other entities, bigger players in, in these spaces where they'll have a discord and it will only be for their members. So if you connect those things, that's how it knows. Once you subscribe, like on Twitch, it will, because your discord's connected to your Twitch channel, links it all up, lets you get some more access, but there are tons of free discords out there. Uh, it's kind of like um, what is, and Slack maybe, so I don't use Slack, but it may be similar in that regard. It's sort of, this is the thing that's sort of displacing forums. Traditional forums are, in my view, they're a dying, uh, dying breed. They may never fully go away, but the, the, the interest in those are just declining because you have to have different logins, different security issues. Are you doing different passwords because you are you don't know what's what might leak out or there's a data breach or whatever. And in these sort of setups, you just sign up through, with Discord and Discord's all you need to remember. And they have apps for the computer and apps for the phone. And I use both. Like the I, I enjoy the PC app. It's really robust. I probably access about 25% of my time on PC and 75% on phone because it's real easy to check on the phone and, and post and you can post photos and all that. So anyway, link is in the uh, chat. Anyone can join it. Just click on the link and it will hopefully guide you through the rest of the process. So let us get to today's topic. I don't know if it'll be a good one or not, but hey, maybe it'll play well on, on the recorded version. And that is to talk about uh, quartz watches, luxury quartz watches. Now, for those that are new to the channel, I normally use a really, really broad definition of luxury. And that's just if the watch basically retails over $1,000, factoring in like Invecta doing 95% offs on all their official retail prices. Obviously, they're not really a luxury brand. Uh, and and I just sort of go from there. So basically, if it's over $1,000, um, usually we might, we throw in some other things like the, the, that you could consider like the watch should have some basic resale or trade value. It should basically retain something that would be a sign of a luxury good. Uh, but uh, with this, that's kind of the initial parameters that I started with. Now, there were a few suggestions uh, that I mentioned at the start from the discord, and I'm going to open with long Jean because it's the one suggestion I didn't know about. I knew about all the other ones. I got, I only got two others, but we'll, we'll walk through a few others. This is going to be web-based. So you're going to see some tabs here. Um, this is a uh, VHP or very high precision quartz that Longine did. I, they, the reason we're at authentic watches website here is because uh, it does not appear Longine sells these anymore. So it, I could not, I went to their website this morning and I trolled around through it. I could not find any VHP branded watches at this stage. Longine still has quartz watches. They weren't the same movement though. And I don't, I don't think they were very high precision. I think uh, Longines probably uh, temporarily retired this and will probably bring it back again. But as near as I could tell, they had these in 2017, 2018. However, they're still readily available. So I wanted to go ahead and, and, do, and do cover them, especially because they were suggested to me in the Discord channel. So let's see. Uh, Scott, one of the 99 Cent Club members, incidentally, says, uh, enjoy you covering different areas of the hobby. We see enough Rolex, Tudor, and Omega pieces online. Uh, well, th thank you for the feedback that, yeah, the reason why you see those so much, incidentally, it's probably pretty obvious, but it's twofold. One, 
Um, a lot of people are into those watches. So there's just a natural instinct for them. And then if you want to get more specific, and I might do a video on this at some point, really like got kind of deep diving what, how YouTube works in particular. Uh, but with the YouTube hat in mind, uh, those brands, they just get a lot more clicks. So if you're like driven by uh, views and you want to see your channel grow or you're trying to generate income on ads. And so you want to see your AdSense revenue grow. You need more clicks. And like Rolex and Tudor, tons of actually Omega, not as strong, but 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 still higher than like Longjean. Longjean might not get a lot of clicks. I found okay success, incidentally, with Longjean, uh, probably because it's luxury, but it's on the affordable end. So uh, certain brands do well. Uh, Seiko, incidentally, I'm I'm gonna kind of ramble a little bit about viewer performance, and some of this could be like thumbnails and and tags and not doing the right ones. And I don't, I haven't researched that honestly well enough to know like how. I know I could do way better. Than what I do, but um, like certain Seikos, like if I do like dress, like dress KX style Seiko videos, they don't do very well. But if I do Seiko divers, uh, they tend to do pretty well. Seiko five videos, again, if they're dressy, not so well. If they're sporty, better. Uh, so there's just, uh, yeah, people chase where, where the demand is. And the demand is generally what either, it's kind of twofold. It's either super like aspirational and people aspire to Rolex more than they do, like the public more than they do Patek or AP or anything. So that's why Rolex does so well. Or watches that they're actually seriously considering buying. And that's where you get like Long Jean and Seiko videos, uh, especially with sports watch lines, they just do well. So that's why everyone gives you, if it feels like you're a goose and you're m being turned into foie gras and they're force feeding you content, it, we kind of are because that's where the views are. And it gets annoying to do the same amount of work for a video and get 500 views when I could get 5,000 if I did Rolex. So it's sort of like that. But on these these live streams get so few views compared to my pre-recorded videos that I kind of do whatever I want because it doesn't matter much. Um, I need something different to talk about too because uh, as a hobbyist, I don't do this for money. Like I have a career. So this is just this is just for fun. I do enjoy the money. Don't get me wrong. I love getting my 99 cents, but, um, but that's not the main motivator. Uh, Koji says, interesting long jeans, a similar dial to the new and weird uh, Patek Philippe Calatrava that was released, I think the 6007, much cooler here in my opinion. Now I just grabbed one uh, VPH. They're actually a variety of different approaches and they have a lot of chronographs. So I do want to specify that as well. So here's a, let me, I can, can I hold down control and get you a better zoom here? No, I cannot. Okay. Well, I tried. Uh, so yes. Yeah, so this is an example of a, and you can see the brand, it's kind of hard to read with the texture. But you can see the branding here, VHP, so very high precision. This is uh, one of their, their VHP movements. They have a, here's an example, it's the L288. So the L289 is the chronograph version, but anyway, so this is long jeans. It's, I count it as luxury because the watch retailed over $1,000. You see, uh, this is a quote unquote on sale watch at $2,000. So they're priced above other long, long jeans quartz on their website, regular quartz. Uh, it's around a thousand to like 1500 ish, depending on the decoration and stuff and the movement, uh, not of the movement, excuse me, of the materials of the watch. Uh, you know, like if they do some, I think some of them have some like dials and stuff or diamonds or, or gems on the dial. Uh, a lot of, a lot of the uh, ladies watches on long jeans site are quartz versus men's. Like they have 200 quartz models and I think 25 are men's. Again, that's not too surprising because I, I've repeatedly heard watch brands indicate that women's watches, they do a lot better selling quartz because a lot of women don't want to deal with the resetting of the watch, I assume, because they wear them for special functions. And uh, so they would wind down a lot more than some men look for one watch and they just wear it all the time. That's my guess. I don't know if that's entirely true. Uh, so anyway, um, so the movement is nothing to look at. This is I mean, it's a zero jewel movement. So you would think you'd look at this if you were me and you'd go, well, this looks like pretty much like any Ronda or anything else. Why is this? It's it doesn't feel like it's a service designed movement because there's no jewels or anything. It's definitely not decorated. Um, so why is it special? Why is this a special luxury level quartz? Well, it gets back to what that dial says with that VHP. So very high precision means exactly what it says. These line of watches, that movement I showed, the L88. That is a plus or minus uh, five seconds per year movement. So the movement itself is very advanced. I mean, obviously we have atomic clock syncing now. You can get a G-Shock. I, I mean, my G-Shock is a radio control sync to the atomic clock. 
that's what your uh, cell phones are relying on is syncing to the atomic clock. So if you get a Bluetooth watch that syncs to the atomic clock, again, I believe there are G-Shocks that do that too. Uh, that's the most accurate you're really going to be able to get. However, if you're interested in quartz regulation that does it all by itself. It's, I don't know if there, there probably are some like really experimental ones out there that have gotten above the plus or minus five seconds a year, even a tighter tolerance, but, but uh, it's really interesting. So if you're really into that concept of quartz and just like that idea of that high precision, like when you think about generic quartz, incidentally, what, what's the range? I generally, when I think of like the low end off the shelf quartz at this stage in the modern era, I think plus or minus 15 seconds a month. And that's kind of where uh, Grand Seiko and their early, their, their, and they still use it, I believe, but the, the earliest or the most regular or the first mass produced spring drives, they were plus or minus 15 seconds a month. And that was the kind of the cool thing. They got that tricycle regulator to the uh, quality of quartz low end quartz, but still quartz way better than mechanical. So, so anyway, so this watch up, oh, I, I took it off the screen. I'll throw it back on here. So this and the whole series of long jeans uses movements, either if not the L88, they use like I mentioned the L89 for the chronograph version. So they, they have this whole series there. And so while the movement itself is not luxuriously featured or even jeweled, it is a very, very impressive piece of tech. And so that's why uh, someone had suggested this, this one. And given the price point and the watches Longjean puts them in, uh, I it's a luxury watch, so it counts as a luxury quartz. So I wanted to mention it uh, because it's it's very precise. Now, again, I, as I noted, they're readily available on place. Again, I just I needed a, an example, uh, so I've gone to Authentic Watch. I never bought through them. But Longjean doesn't have these on the website anymore. So I'm guessing they, at least for a while, discontinued the VHP until I assume maybe they bring it back at some stage. Uh, catching up with the chat, uh, Kevin, good morning, Kevin. I hope things are going well out in Florida for you. And uh, Von Krul, if I'm pronouncing, I'm never sure if I'm pronouncing your name right, but I'm uh, I'm 50% I'm confident. That's that's not confident at all. Uh, says, hi, Dennis and chat. Uh, this topic is near and dear to my heart. Uh, yeah, actually, uh, I think it was Scott uh, G earlier in the uh, chat who talked about liking to see different things in the hobby. I think Scott was the one who, I think he emailed me and asked if I would do quartz. Uh, so I've had it on my list for a few weeks to uh, to hit on. Not an area of my expertise. And I uh, I didn't do a wristwatch check. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I am feel bad because Scott was like, I'm tired. We see enough Rolex. I'm wearing my uh, Explorer 2, the 16570. Uh, Cause again, whenever I do live stream topics, I don't coordinate anything. So I didn't reach into my watch box and grab a quartz. I do not own a luxury quartz watch. Uh, I have two quartz watches. I have a G-Shock and I have a Mr. Jones watch that's quartz, but neither of those would meet my definition of, of luxury. So uh, I guess the closest I ever came would be, I did have a spring drive, but I don't own it anymore. I got rid of it earlier in the year. Uh, and spring drive is, a, I think it's kind of its own thing. I wouldn't count it as quartz though. I would count the watch as luxury. Obviously, it does use quartz for the tricycle regulator, but it just operates on such a different principle. I wouldn't really count it. So, Ron Krul says, my only high accuracy quartz so far is my Beluva Lunar Pilot. I've heard good things about those, incidentally, as an aside, but continuing with the chat, it's scary accurate, and I've never seen it lose or gain a full second because of daylight savings time changes twice per year. Koji says, I think uh, House wore a Hamilton khaki in the show. I haven't, oh gosh, I never even, I wasn't into collecting back then. I did watch all of House. Um, I think I got in like during the writer strike. So I, I watched like DVD versions or something and got caught up. And then I watched the show like the last two or three seasons where I liked it all the way up through like when they introduced 13 and then, so, yeah, that, that was the writer strike season actually. And then after that, especially the last season of House, I did not care for, but, but anyway, um, Okay, a khaki. I did not. I did not uh, know what he. But that doesn't surprise me. Uh, Hamilton. This is an aside from quartz, uh, though. I'm sure Hamilton probably does some. Um, Hamilton has like this weird relationship. I shouldn't say weird. Uh, really cozy relationship with Hollywood. So they're in a lot. Like I went and saw the Dial of Destiny, Indiana Jones movie, and Hamilton did the watch for Harrison Ford in that which is referenced in the film because uh, he gets mad because someone tries to take it and it's his dad's watch. So he points out it's his dad's watch. So yeah, Hamilton does that a lot. You see a lot of Hamiltons in Christopher Nolan films as well. So it wouldn't shock me that they're involved in television in addition to movies. 
And uh, the Digital Wealth Podcast. Uh, welcome to the live stream. Says excellent topic. I own a few Rolex Oyster Quartz. Oyster Quartz is a it would be an excellent example of a luxury quartz uh, watch. Unfortunately, I won't be covering those because they discontinued them from so long ago. You have to buy them used. And I tried to stick with things you could still get new, uh, but for a long time those were a very good deal. Uh, I know a lot of people. In fact, they became they were such a good deal. Everyone like on YouTube who sold watches started talking about what a good deal they were. And now I don't know that they're a good deal anymore. I'd say maybe they're a fair deal. But um, but if you're into quartz and you like the Rolex look, uh, go ahead and check out Oyster Quartz. Uh, the movements themselves look really nice, which is, again, interesting because they're closed case back. Uh, and let's see. And Von Krull says, my quartz grail is probably citizen of oh, the citizen. AQ4091-56L. Jody from uh, Just One More Watch. Where's the Citizen Chronomaster as his daily now? Okay, I uh, I did not know that. I don't watch Jody all that much because um, he covers watches that generally don't interest me. But uh, but I am I am familiar with his channel, obviously, because I knew the abbreviation. Um, so you you mentioned Ron Kroll. You mentioned uh, Citizen. So I do want to jump to them now. Uh, so when I was doing my research, Citizen did come up quite a bit. Uh, most of the citizen high precision, again, a uh, luxury, but we're going to focus on high precision yet again. Um, whereas Japan only, at least, uh, what I was, what I was mostly finding accessible was listed as Japan only. And again, uh, like if I went to citizens general website, didn't find the watches, you go to other places like, uh, like this site here. And all of a sudden they show up and you can see what they're again. And the pricing is around that long gene pricing. So we're kind of talking in that one to two thousand dollar space that you can find watches like this. Um, so this is and again, this is just one example. There are many, many flavors of it, uh, just like the long gene. It's you know, they're not display. They're not advertising the look of the movement. But again, uh, high, high course accuracy. This is plus or five uh, seconds per year in accuracy. This actually is driven by the A660. I do like to try and show you pictures of movements when I can. So, so here's that image. Again, uh, not a decorated movement. Um, this actually, though, is jeweled, uh, unlike what we saw out of Longjing. Longjing was a, a zero jewel movement. I believe this is, uh, it's hard to read, but uh, you can kind of make out down here. It does, well, if you're on a big screen, you're on your phone, you're out of luck. But it says 17. So there, it's a 17 jewel movement. Which is very, con you know, very mechanically conventional. Seventeen jewels, kind of the go-to standard for a time-only mechanical movement, uh, by by many uh, by many manufacturers at least. So anyway, that's the A six six zero. Basically, the same performance specs as the Long Jean. I don't know if there's. I didn't research like the difference in battery life and stuff, but um, but again, plus or minus five seconds per year. Uh, I like this notation that tells you you can't just determine the accuracy. Uh, uh, by uh, dividing the annual accuracy by 12. Instead, they, you know, because temperature and stuff affect these things. And that's one of the things that high accuracy quartz is really focused on mastering is trying to deal with those temperature variances. And that's something Royal Rolex Oyster Quartz is noted for is even back as old as that movement is that they were able to do temperature compensation um, to get what they got going with that to make it a really good quartz movement of the era. Uh, was very impressive. And that's still something that's really focused on a lot. I think Citizen, if you are, I mean, and again, this is priced in the luxury space, but uh, just talking high accuracy quartz in general, if I were to look anywhere, I would personally look in Citizen's way. They have done an awful lot in high accuracy quartz. They're very well known in it. And again, as I, I showed you with that image of the A660, I mean, they, in some ways, uh, not, I, I won't even say in some ways, in all ways, this to me looks like a more interesting movement, even though I wouldn't be looking at it. I appreciate the idea behind it, that it's jeweled. That really suggests that they want it to be serviced. Um, and I don't think the long gene is necessarily a throwaway movement. I mean, quartz generally just needs battery changes in and of itself. And if they've got a high accuracy, it should be relatively robust, but they've clearly made it in a way that, that it can be serviced to citizens. And so it would just be the brand I would turn to their reputation in quartz is in my opinion, the strongest of any brand. Um, and maybe they don't get enough credit because it always feels like, you know, when we talk Japanese brands, it's always Seiko, Seiko, Seiko. And then citizen is almost an afterthought. And I did a poll over a month ago of uh, on the, it wasn't of the channel members, it was on the channel about asking people about their opinion of Seiko versus citizen. And I mean, Seiko uh, curb stomped citizen, uh, quite frankly. 
the number there were a few people who said they were kind of they respected them equally but but people preferring citizen over seiko was very very low and i think that's because seiko has more of a reputation on mechanical movements even though citizen is playing in that space quite a bit more now than they used to and um and i think people forget but like citizen pioneered eco drive uh, Citizens High Accuracy Quartz has been, I mean, they've worked in that space for a long time. So there's just a lot. This is incidentally, this is not a, I've seen some people accidentally, I'm assuming it's an accident, call the A660 an, an eco drive movement. It's not eco drive movement. It is a battery driven movement. Um, I don't know if they have high accuracy eco drive. Maybe. I've not looked into that. Don't know enough about it. Um, but uh, but that is one of the examples that I thought uh, was, was really worth uh, talking about. So uh, I want to go ahead and get caught up with the chat. Koji really liked the dial on the citizen. I'll go ahead and put that back up so people can see it. Uh, can I zoom in? So it looks like I, well, it shows me a little plusy plus symbol, but I click and it says, go away, Dennis. Doesn't work. Okay. Doesn't work. Sorry. Uh, hi, Tuna. Welcome to the live stream. Uh, yeah. Von Krul said thermal compensation there. See, there's a good, there's always a science word. It's always a science word. Temperature controlled sounds very crude, but I am from the Midwest, so that is how we how we speak. Um, Von Krull says Grand Seiko's nine F movements are the best looking, as far as I know, and uh, we will be touching on that. Don't worry. How could how could we not? That was the first suggestion that came in. I made that uh, I made a nine F the uh, the thumbnail though for the for the video stream. So I think I think people knew that was going to come up. Uh, Tuna says here in the West they say that the Chronomaster is highly underrated. And I think there were some statements from uh, Von Kroll earlier about that, about the Chronomaster and uh, about it, want, him wanting it to be his his sort of uh, quartz grail, or it is his quartz grail. Not one, He doesn't want it to be. He's already moved it into that particular space. Now, before we get to Grand Seiko, that will come up uh, after this next watch. I don't have a movement picture of this, but Breitling does play in the, in the, in the quartz space. I mean, a lot of luxury brands do, but in terms of kind of that they put some advertising or some marketing uh, advertising might be a bit strong of a word. They put some marketing heft behind um, behind their quartz movement, but it's interesting because the precision is not as good as the citizen and the long gene that we've just talked about. So when I went to their website, the one that really jumped out to me is the endurance pro line. So the endurance pro and uh, incidentally, I don't have these in dollar order. We're not just progressively going up in price because grand Seiko is cheaper than I'll just go ahead and mention that now, but retail 3,400 us dollars. So we're talking some pretty significant, you know, we're I, in my mind, you're moving out of entry and more into that mid tier luxury space. But of course that depends how you define those terms. Cause I know some people that say mid tier luxury starts at $10,000. And to me, once we're at spending $10,000, we're spending an awful lot of money because you're now looking at the you know, like economy cars at that stage, but we all have our different approaches. Hmm. So I'm scrolling down so you can see some movement. I don't have, I looked online, could not find a movement on this particular movement. This is their B80, the caliber 80. So they, they advertise this as, again, there's that word from Von Krull, thermal compensated. They call it super quartz, super quartz. If you ever saw Saturday Night Live and Superstar, but anyway, I, I digress. However, um, the, Accuracy of the movement is not plus or minus five seconds per year. It's plus or minus 10 seconds per year. So it's not as high precision as high precision. Uh, I guess that's the price of super cards. But um, four joule movement, couldn't show you a picture of it. Uh, standard battery approach with standard, in my view, standard battery life. Uh, you know, two years, two to three years is what I expect out of a conventional quartz movement. So in this instance, while the the movement itself is is much more accurate than a rate like if you're looking luxury quartz you you want more than like that ba a basic ronda right you want something more in it and they've given you that and again this is a chronograph movement as well but you really need to consider everything else that's going into like do you like this style of watch do you like what the endurance pros bring to the table those other factors are really going to have to come in play when it comes to discussion of the price because on the movement tech like precision wise, it's just not there with the with the long gene and the citizen. It's just not. So, uh, but it's still a good movement. I don't want to act like well, that's a garbage movement. But you know, these are the things we have to evaluate as potential buyers. Is are we comfortable paying another what fifteen to fifteen hundred to two thousand U.S. dollars for a movement that we we're going in or knowing it's less accurate? I mean, they point out it's Cosk certified super court. So I mean, it meets a particular standard. And again, 
it's not a bad movement. I'm not trying to suggest that. This has other things though. It's got that bright light technology to help reduce scratches on the on the case. Uh, and uh, because that's a titanium case, so it's a coated titanium. So there are other things definitely in play on this particular watch. But I wanted to point it out because, you know, Breitling is a very well-respected luxury brand. A lot of people might not consider Citizen a luxury brand, even though they do have watches definitely in that space. Uh, likewise, Longines in the hierarchy of people's minds is probably ranked below Breitling. At least I rank it below Breitling. So, so in that regard, this might be if you if you're wanting a, uh, a maybe a more storied uh, storied might be a bit strong of a word because Longines has quite a heritage to it. But if you're wanting a, a more popular brand, uh, Breitling might be might be a route that you want to consider going down, uh, especially if you like some of these functionality. Like there's a lot. I mean. Again, chronograph, it's going to raise the price some. Titanium, we, titanium is always more expensive than steel when it comes to watches. They all charge more for it. So it's just, it's one of those things to sort of consider. Uh, Scott says, I didn't realize the EcoDrive 1 retails for 4750 Yes. The, again, when I said uh, Citizen may not be considered luxury, but they have luxury pieces. Yeah, the, the Eco 1. Aren't those ultra thin though? Um, I think that might be the issue for it. I think they're very thin watches. Uh, it's probably part of the motivation. I've looked at them before, but it's been a while. Um, Citizen does all sorts of really interesting stuff. Uh, my very first quote unquote nice watch, I mentioned it before, was a Citizen, just a regular quartz chronograph. I, but sadly, I don't know. I, I'm looking around like I'm going to see it all of a sudden on my desk. <laughs> I don't know. I know where the link, like I have my spare links. I, I started, I've started to suspect um, I had a burglary in 2019 before I was watch collecting. Uh, one of my, I don't know, little relic watch that um, was still here, but uh, I wonder if the Citizen got stolen. I don't know. What was, mostly it was electronics that were stolen, but uh, they didn't steal the Rolex because I wore it because that was the only watch I was wearing that day. So anyway, I don't know if I lost it, which is possible because I quit wearing it once I got my 16570 or if it was taken. I don't know. But anyway, that's my first quote unquote nice watch. Uh, first like stainless steel watch. So I always have a soft spot still for Citizen. Um Let's see. Uh, Tuna says the Endurance Pro has never really done it for me. Well, I mean, I don't really like the, I'm going to throw it back up here again. I don't really personally like the look of it either. Uh, those who, again, if you've watched the videos for a while, you know, I don't like uh, cropped Arabic numeral hour markers. So these three, six, and nine getting carved out from the subdials is immediately a no factor for me. Um, also, I don't know if I like the texturing uh, that they've done to the bezel. The titanium looks kind of neat, but I prefer more of this, the standard like grade two brush titanium look if we're going titanium. Uh, I, you know, we could explore some stuff with grade five and polishing and stuff, but this almost looks like it wanted to be PVD coated and maybe that's that bright light technology going on it. Um, but uh, the, the sub dial uh, configuration alone, I've never resonated with these super, what I call huge uh, hour markers. Um, like this, the just these fatty three six nines. They've never, even when they're not cropped, they've never really worked for me. Little too nineties uh, for my taste, I guess would be my thought. But um, but I thought some of you might like it, so I wanted to throw. It. And I needed an example of a nice uh, luxury quartz watch, and it definitely is luxury, and it definitely is quartz. So it met those conditions. Uh, Von Kroll says it's also possible that they're just being more conservative with the accuracy claim. Perhaps, perhaps the plus or minus 10 seconds per year is uh, just what the cost measurement is. And if it met cost, it met cost. And, and they just ensure that it does that. Uh, Scott feels the dial is too busy. That is uh, a good point, but hardly something unique to uh, this model from Breitling, right? I mean, half the Breitling lineup is busy. Uh, like the Navitimers, that's their whole bread and butter is, hey, how busy can we make this thing with slide rules and and chrono uh, subs and, and uh, all of that? It's just uh, I think they like to lean really heavily into their tool watch uh, heritage. And so because of that, with all the functionality they're trying to put in, I think the dial uh, aesthetic just takes a backseat to it. I mean, it, it does seem pretty readable. So I, I'll give them credit. Like if I wanted all of this capability like with the pulse, the pulsation scale and the and the clear chronograph subs and the use of the uh, like neon yellow uh, and all of that um, and a very subtle date window, but still easy to read. Um, I mean, it's it's well designed for legibility. I'd, I'd say that, but that's probably probably it. 
Uh, Tuna says, I'm only about that Cartier must sell more quartz than anything. You're probably right. Again, uh, I, I kind of touched on it earlier in the video where there have been watch, uh, I think it's mostly been watch manufacturers, might be some retailers who have mentioned that uh, women in particular, they, send, they tend to sell a lot more quartz too. And the speculation, my speculation has been, if a lot of watches are picked up for parties or like cocktail events, or I don't know what people do with their bourgeois lifestyles, but but basically, if you want to watch where you want to pick up and go and they don't and they're wearing them more as jewelry, then quartz watches mean that you don't have to set them all the time and you don't worry about winders. Whereas uh, with men, I think it's usually a couple of things. One, they have like their their one watch. So they're always winding it or it's automatic. So it's not a big deal. Or they're like a hardcore collector. And this would apply to anyone, you know, men or women, obviously. Hardcore collectors either get winders or they like winding the watches or whatever. So uh, you know, it's just different. So, um, but like as a case in point, growing up, my dad uh, had one watch that I know, a quartz watch, but he had one watch. And my mom, who, who was a nurse, she had like, gosh, I don't, she had me change the batteries a couple of years ago. She had, must have been two dozen different watches because she just like mix and match them with what color went with her scrubs for that day or whatever. So it was just, uh, just different approach, different approaches to the, you know, it was more of an accessory for her. Uh, I mean, she needed the time telling, but she wanted it to integrate better. And my dad just like, he just needed a timepiece while he was, he doesn't wear a watch anymore after he retired. Cause he's like, I don't need it every day anymore. So that's just the way, that's just the way it was in my household. Um, but uh, Cartier, uh, not on my list. I thought about it. Uh, again, I don't know if they have any, like <sighs> the tank, uh, excuse me, the the Santos de Cartier's, the quartz ones, uh, they have like a longer uh, battery life, but I didn't see anything about accuracy. And again, luxury quartz didn't mean I have to do accuracy. And one of these might not necessarily be it, but there wasn't really anything quote unquote impressive about it. Solar beat is impressive. If we bring up Solar Beat and the Solar Beat tank, all I end up doing is whining about why isn't there a Solar Beat Santos? And I didn't want to put you all through that again because I swear I brought it up either the last video or the video before. So we're shutting our mouth. We're not doing it. And instead, we're going to go to Grand Seiko. How could we not? Right? It was the thumbnail. The movement was the thumbnail. There are so many different looks uh, that they've got. Grand Seiko obviously plays in three major spaces of movement. They play in the mechanical. Uh, a lot of high beat, but not exclusively so. They play in spring drive. My personal favorite out of Grand Seiko is the spring drive movement. And they play in quartz. And they do not play in the kiddie pool side of quartz. They like accuracy. Now, just like the Bright Lane, the 9F series is a plus or minus 10 second per year standard, not five. So that was a little surprising to me because I've heard so much about Grand Seiko's quartz movements. but that's the standard measurement that they're going with. They're not going with what Citizen and Longjean have said. So here is a photo, incidentally, of the 9F85. Uh, and this is the first instance that I've given you with a watch movement that actually looks like it would be cool to look at through a display case back. Now, Grand Seiko is not going to give you a grand display case back with this nine with this nine uh nine F movement, but um the I think I've zoomed in, that's why it looks so weird. So, uh, but these watches and see the pricing, uh, very approachable for entry luxury, right? So we're, we've passed the long gene and citizen prices that I showed you with the high accuracy quartz movements, uh, but we've only added about a thousand dollars, uh, in some cases less than that. And so for under $3,000, you can get into Grand Seiko and you can, uh, you can go and, and do something with one of their plus or minus 10 second per year, uh, movements. So, uh, battery life's decent too, about three years versus the two, like we saw with the bright lane. Uh, part of that could be though, this isn't a chronograph. So that, that might very well help that along as well. Uh, and I wanted to go ahead and pull, I thought I was, I was clicking back cause I thought how I searched it. This is actually their current lineup of these watches that are using the nine F eight, five movement specifically, which I think is their most, I they have a few different variants of depending on features like uh, GMT hands can get a different movement number, but Basically, that's their modern quartz movement. As you can see, the price ranging stays pretty tight from that $2,600 to $3,200 range, or excuse me, $3,800 apparently. Is, oh, I'm wrong. There's the $3,900. Let's look at the $3,900. All right. Basically, $2,500 to $4,000. Let's say that. That's your range. So there's a decent spread there, but compared to a, a lot of other things in their catalog, 
it's uh it's very pretty approachable and this one's so high because it's an anniversary watch as well yeah, it's a 60 it's an le it's it grand seiko still tied to seiko folks they can't help but do le's they just they just got to do it so um incidentally i want to load this one up for you the spg p009 this is what my spring drive version looked like i had the spga 283 and that's it looked just like this except it said spring drive here and it had the power reserve over here uh, but otherwise it was this champagne dial which this champagne dial looks really really cool um there's a whole i don't even remember where i read it there's a whole thing about how they do that dial it's actually people always you know talk about like the like the snowflake and stuff but those champagne style dials are like a 13 coat process i think someone with grand seiko at one point said it was actually the hardest dial that they make it's the one that they have to put the most effort into hard i shouldn't say hard in the sense like there's a big risk of breaking it uh because i don't think it's like enamel or anything but but um but it was a very processed approach where some of the their texturing isn't actually that difficult uh comparatively or i guess that time consuming or something like that but anyway uh so yeah so you've got this uh jeweled movement you see there's all sorts of adjustability really good looking movements i this is uh i've always thought this was really really interesting so anyway so yeah the 9f series grand seiko um uh, i see this uh grand seiko is recommended a lot for people who want to get into a luxury watch and um and you get a lot of value because the finishing is on the watches is the same regardless of like the the movement is moot to the finishing so if you want like the Zaratsu polishing and the, the, you know, hand applied indices and the dial work, there's no harm in going quartz with Grand Seiko. It's not like a less finished watch versus a spring drive or a high beat or anything like that. So that's the attraction as well is you get a really, really, I mean, their most accurate watches are the quartz watches and you get the same level of finishing, but you will pay significantly less than if you were to jump up to say into the spring drive space. So it's it's there's a lot to like about it so if you're if you're into quartz or you really want a luxury watch and you don't care about movement i would definitely say go ahead and explore grand seiko if you can because uh they're i mean prices have been going up lately because people are appreciating them a lot more now grand seiko is doing a lot better job positioning itself in the market but these are still quite readily approachable and remember you can always look used The nice thing about uh, quartz movements is, aside from a battery swap, you generally don't have to fret too much about it needing a quote unquote service. It might need a battery. So, and that's not expensive to go get done. Or you could do it yourself. I mean, you can see from this movement, it's not like it's hard to access the battery if you're comfortable taking the back off of a watch. And screw down uh, case backs, I don't have any concern with, but um, but some people might. So anyway, so that's Grand Seiko, the perhaps the poster child for luxury quartz. It's definitely the brand I think of first and foremost. I think of Citizen first and foremost if you tell me quartz watches, but I think of Grand Seiko if you add the word luxury before. So let's see, catching up with chat. Tuna says, if you want to watch, just want a watch that works, then quartz is the logical choice. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, the, there's so much less friction involved as well. It's more likely to work. Um, again, battery changes aside. Uh, Von Krull says, the SPGP009 is the one I might choose from Grand Seiko, the champagne dial. Well, I should have seen your chats earlier because I just waxed poetic about the champagne dial. It was my one of my most favorite dials. Uh, my issue with the Grand Seiko, I had no problem with the watch. Well, I did scuff it. Uh, I scratch all my watches, but I scuffed it on a washing machine which was sad inside the washing machine. I was, I was taking out the laundry and I, I scuffed, I scuffed the Zeratsu. So that was annoying. But when I was going and getting a, a higher tier lug, uh, dress watch, it was like, I just need to unload watches. I was, I was wearing in the dress space. Cause I got rid of every dre dress watch I had or, or sports watch. I used as a dress watch other than uh, my reverse. So I got rid of everything else. And so the grand Seiko just had to go to make that achievable. Um, uh, Tuna says, "For quartz, so far as quartz watches go, the Grand Seiko is magnificent." And Von Krill says, "The SPG P001 is also interesting with the 44 Grand Seiko case." Yeah, one thing I will note about Grand Seikos for folks, this is a warning. And the SPG P009 is a 40 millimeter watch. Um, uh, most of the sizing runs they wear a little bulky. Uh, that's more so perhaps with the spring drive, though. So. Um, because that version, the spring drive version is a 39 millimeter watch, which I liked kind of thick, 
not not like unwearably thick or anything, just thicker than you might have thought it had been uh, for the size of the watch. Um, my biggest complaint I've ever had with Grand Seiko is the bracelets. Uh, kind of like Omega 300M, like they just don't feel that great. Uh, like I don't, I don't think it tapered at all. Uh, and the link chain, I, and I always whine about this, even though it's a one-time thing for an owner, but uh, the link system was annoying too. It's a double, it's like a screw link system, but it was weird. Um, so each link uh, on the one I had, at least, I don't know if they've changed it up since then. Each side of the link has a, has a screw head and they're super small screws and a pin is in between them. I've never seen anyone else use a system like that. Most screwed links are, you know, it's threaded on one end, the screw head's on the other, and it just goes in. Uh, Zenith, which I also hate <laughs> as a model, uh, does the, the double screw head like the Grand Seiko's, except one is like a hollowed post. So one is a short screw that goes into the post, and the other is the, is the post. That's like the length of a, the, the link. So it's not as easy to lose, like, like putting it all in, but you have to hold it still to turn it. So in a way it's worse than the Grand Seiko. Actually, Zenith was worse. I'll put it like that, but they both, they both suck. It's a bad model. Um, just do regular, just do a single screw side. I don't get it. Why be, why, why are they being cute about it? Uh, don't be cute. It's not cute. It's, it's dumb. I was just say it's a dumb model. Uh, I'd rather have cotter pins. Uh, I have one, uh, one last uh, quartz watch that I wanted to touch on. How could we not? Right. Right. FP Jorn, we're we're all in the market, right? We all are just constantly shopping F FP Jorns. So uh, I first saw this watch on. Um, oh, it had to be the the Kevin O'Leary Teddy Baldassar uh, video. So it was on Teddy Baldassar's channel. Uh, they went to the FP Jorn uh, boutique, I guess, and I didn't know anything about FP Jorn, but this watch was a focus. Uh, so this is a coarse powered watch, obviously, or else it wouldn't be on this list. A uh, biggie, it's a biggie, 48 millimeter, or at least uh, in some, one of the measurements, maybe that's just the lug to lug, in which case that's not that big. Um, so, but titanium, uh, price of this watch, let's get that out of the way. So if you were able to buy it new, they have like 20 flavors of this watch. It's basically around 15,000 US dollars. On the used market, I think it goes for double plus. Like I want to think I saw 30 to 50,000, but I, I don't, I didn't, I didn't dive into it. I'm not in the market for this watch and some things, the watch is cool, but there's some things about it. I don't personally care for aesthetically, but I wanted to point it out because it's very, very interesting. So I don't know the accuracy level of the quartz movement used in this watch, but what they've done is they've configured this quartz to do some, do some fun things. So it actually to save battery life, it goes into a rest mode and mentions this in the narrative here. It says like after 35 minutes of the watch, not moving around the watch quits visibly displaying the time anymore. And I think they note, um, they go ahead and they note that on uh, the battery specs of this watch. If I remember correctly, must've been on a different site. It's like 18 years. If it was in rest mode the entire time, that's how long the battery would last. Of course, that's not very useful. Eight years is probably the, uh, yeah, daily use. Okay, daily use. So, so pretty efficient watch. So go ahead and call. I, I mean, I mentioned like Cartier has some efficient quartz watches. I get like five years without solar beat uh, factoring in, but um, but this is pretty impressive. Uh, loom. I want to go ahead and show you the loom uh, because that's pretty cool too. So it's got that sort of full dial uh, look, like almost like what I think out of a Timex or something. Like uh, so, that's kind of neat. Uh, so very, very sporty in that regard. But so it's in the standby mode. I actually put it in standby mode here at just before 745 in the morning, because that's when I went and I loaded this watch up <laughs> for today's video. See, I do all this advanced planning. Aren't, aren't I nice? Now, when it's in active mode, go ahead and watch the hands and I will I will trigger this. And that's how it works. You'll actually see it move just like that. And it catches back up the proper time. And then you start to see the 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 deadbeat tick that we often associate with quartz, uh, which isn't a requirement of quartz, that's to save battery life. Um, and the watch is in its active timekeeping mode. So very, very cool when you wake it up, like a neat little, like, uh, you know, fun little Easter egg toy, kind of like the Zenith Chrono Masters in there, uh, you know, uh, uh, central hand second, uh, whipping around the dial once every 10 seconds for the chronograph function. Practical? Eh, how accurate are people at stopping on a 10th of a second? Possible for sure, but yeah. But it's really cool party trick, right? 
So that's this party trick, a party trick that you get to wake up to every morning for a mere $15,000. I want to go ahead and show you the movement though. Uh, a little bit of a blurry photo, I'm afraid, but I've blown it up so you can you can see it a bit better because they do actually put it in a display case back. <laughs> this is the only one I found for you guys with a display case back. Um, and they, you know, so you can see the circuit layouts and stuff. This is an 18 joule movement. So it now takes the record away from Citizen 17 joule. Um, something I hadn't noticed until just before we went live. A little, they made a little heart symbol on the around the circuit area. Now, this is this is a just a broadly popular watch. It's the cheapest way to get into FP Jorn if you're actually able to secure one at the boutique. It's probably cheaper, honestly, on the used market than any of their other watches, too. My understanding is this was originally launched, probably not in this size, but was originally watched as a, launched as a women's watch. So FP Jorn had targeted this again with that whole stereotype women prefer quartz sort of thing, launched the watch uh, in that market. However, uh, because of the features, the wake up functionality, the cleverness of the quartz, uh, and you know, the clean dial, the case is not, there's nothing like, it's not like a bedazzled sort of thing. So when you look at the watch, it seems pretty unisex. So, uh, at least in my opinion. So anyway, uh, apparently in the opinion of many people, so that all of a sudden became very, very popular and, uh, they kind of reshifted their marketing to make this uh this the elegante uh a unisex style uh line and they really expanded it up so uh all that stuff you know you know rubber straps and luminescent dials and and cool party trick and expensive well everything everyone loves so so that's what they ended up doing so anyway it's been fairly successful of course fp jorn doesn't have a problem selling his watches at this point so uh but but interesting so it's just a it's sort of an interesting history there because it's sort of something that sort of started as I understand it, on the on the women's side, and then was so popular that it got expanded out into being a watch for for anybody and everybody, and all sorts of colors and sizes and and all of that stuff. But as Tuna points out, it is a hell of a lot for a quartz watch. Um, a lot of that is paying for the name, in my opinion. Uh, at this point, I'm sure they've recouped the R and D on the, what that movement does. But it's a cool movement, definitely a cool movement, and uh, you know, looked and designed for display. Which again, the Grand Seikos are the only other ones we've looked at today that in any sort of decoration, and that's the decoration only your watchmaker is going to appreciate, or you if you are doing your battery swaps. Von Krull says, "Dead beat seconds is a fun complication for mechanicals, in my opinion. Uh, yeah, a lot of uh, maybe I shouldn't say a lot. A few brand, brands are are playing around with that, and I would say it's. I'm trying to remember. I think there was an Asian nation back." probably pre-quartz, where that's when historically on vintage models, when there were deadbeats. I, I want to think it was China, but I'm not sure. I'm not positive that it was China, but I think it was a it was, it was a country in Asia where the sweep of mechanical was not was not liked, I guess maybe is the way to say it. Like it was seen as, I'm not sure, sloppy or something. And so the deadbeat, like it was like, it was respected aesthetically. Like it was just a better look, which I just think is really, if that story is true, I just find it really fascinating because what attracts so many people initially to mechanical watches, it's watching the second hand sweep around the dial, knowing that it's mechanical because of that, that stuttering tick that, that sweeps around. And, but there was a time where the, at least some cultures, so it said that, that precise second, second, second jumping was respected. I could say, had we not grown up with quartz watches doing that, I think it probably would have seen, uh, been, be seen as a lot more special back in the day. Cause it was, it was a challenge. And again, I think some people are liking to try and do that challenge and doing it mechanically again. Uh, so yes, uh, I agree. It's a, it's a pretty fun, uh, sort of thing. Uh, let's see. Uh, Von Kroll says Brit Pierce. Uh, okay. The, I don't, did she rename her watch gringo was the channel name i think it was some of the channels have changed right like uh bark and jack is now just adrian bark like it seems like some of the i assume when you get big enough you just change your channel to your name uh maybe is the thing my name's in my channel my first name um okay uh so she she had a elegante oh, okay but it was stolen or oh, stolen from her husband okay when he he left the boutique and it got stolen i think i vaguely remember hearing i didn't know what watch it was i remember hearing that there was a theft um i think oh yeah 
I remember hearing there was a theft because I remember hearing there was some, there was, it might have been on Watch You Seek or something, because there was some blowback on uh, about uh, a go, someone set up a GoFundMe or something for her. And so, and of course, the, the tacky look of asking for a GoFundMe to replace your luxury product um, sort of thing. Uh, but that, yeah, no, that'd be really unfortunate to have, to, to have a luxury watch stolen. Um, have anything stolen. I guess, uh, I mean, I, I mentioned the burglary earlier, which I probably had like, I don't know, $3,500 worth of stuff taken. Uh, and it was just kind of like, it's the violation uh, that more so than anything, but, uh, but I, I'm insured. So like other than my deductible, uh, you know, I had a 1% or whatever of the house value. Uh, you know, I was able to get refunded for all the, you know, like the Xbox and stuff that they took. So I mean, it was annoying. The worst thing for, in my instance, was uh, the window they smashed. You know, I had to get the window replaced. So it took like a month to order that window. So I went, I went full old country style, like I was brought up and had a, like a trash bag. No, I had some plastic wrap taped up to keep that, uh, keep the elements out of that window. Gla that was my pinball room too, is the where they smashed it. So I had glass all over my machine. They didn't damage my machines, but they chucked a brick through the window. So there was glass on the all, all over the pinball machines. I had to vacuum like three times trying to get up all that, get up all that stuff. It was it was a mess. It was a mess. Uh, so uh, just having something stolen off of you, like you left around uh, and or set down, and someone took it. I mean, I don't know if it was, if it was a mugging or not. That would probably be pretty intimidating. But it, uh, the way. Uh, but like if you accidentally left it or something and someone stole it, I mean, at least you're not hurt. So that's always, a, you know, try and look on the bright side. At least no one, at least nobody was hurt. I hope I haven't heard if her husband was hurt or not. Hopefully he was not injured. Um, and yeah, Von Crow. Okay. Good, okay. I am remembering a little bit about the controversy. I, uh, I don't think I subscribed to her channel. I've watched it a few times, obviously. I only, I, I don't know who I'm subscribed to. Honestly, I might be. And I just don't remember. I have so many watch channels that I'm subscribed to that they don't, you know, the algorithm decides who shows up at the top of the list. I just haven't seen her videos up at my top of my list lately. Uh, Tuna says in London, luxury watch theft is an issue. I've, yeah, I've heard that. I've heard that uh, quite a bit. Uh, and again, I, I know there's another, I think it's uh, Paul Thorpe. I don't usually watch his channel though either. Um, who seemed because all he seemed to do was talk about watch theft, and I, I started to wonder if that was just playing well with the algorithm. Because if you bring, or is it really like, is everyone like, are thousands of watches being stolen a day? Because the impression I was getting was that, like, if you walked into London, you will not have a watch. That's how it kind of started to feel. I haven't been to London since 2008, so and then I, uh, um, I don't remember, I probably, I don't remember if I own my Rolex yet or not, honestly. Um, Whatever watch I wore, I definitely wore a watch, and I didn't think about anything. But, but it's one of it's one of those it's one of those things. So interesting. So uh, Von Cross says, "Yeah, for being a niche hobby, there's no shortage of channels." Well, that's true. Uh, Pinball's kind of like that too. Um, it's, uh, I mean, I think in the case of watches, one of the things is because there's such a desire to do like up close photography and like macro shots and stuff, and you can use that equipment to film. It kind of lends itself like you you're like, oh, I wanna like I'm into I'm into cameras. So getting into YouTube with you're into cameras is is easier. Uh I do YouTube. <laughs> I did actually did YouTube for this. Uh my reasons are so are, are so shockingly boring, I suppose, comparatively, is because I did podcasting. I do podcasting in my other hobby. So I wanted to learn like something different. I didn't want to just do audio. So I thought, oh, let's learn how to do video. And so, and, uh, and if you look at my early videos and the color balance and all the stuff, it's just like, it was, it was a, there was a learning curve there. Um, so I just did it to pick up a different content creation skill set was my idea. So I, that's why I don't podcast in watches because I already podcast in pinball so much and I don't do YouTube stuff for pinball because I do it over here and I just, that's it. Like I have a camera background or anything. Uh, I did do some live streaming on Twitch for pinball. I don't really do that much anymore because that is a huge pain in the butt. It's not like video games. You need lots of cameras. You need like at least three to do a good job. It's just annoying. Um, and in the chat, just so folks know, I've uh, I've got a link. Uh, Discord is open to everyone. We've, uh, we've moved that from being a 99 cent club perk to being for anyone. And of course, if you want to join the 99 cent club, I have a link to that as well. They have a channel that they can talk to just themselves on the Discord, but otherwise the Discord is fully open uh, for everyone. 
Uh, Scott says, I think you need to be aware in any major city where while wearing an expensive watch. Um, that would make sense. I, uh, my recommendation, I'm not like a world traveler. So take my recommendation with as much salt as you want is I would worry more about your wallet than anything. So like when I go uh, traveling, I don't put the wallet in the back. Pocket. Like if you wear jeans, sometimes you put the, a lot of times I almost always put my wallet in my back pocket. When I'm traveling or I'm anywhere where I'm not comfortable, if I'm in any crowded, even if I'm in Kansas, I'm in a crowded area, I put the wallet in the front pocket so that it cannot be picked. That's going to be the thing that you're most likely going to lose because most most theft crimes are non-confrontational. They don't want to risk a fight. They don't want to risk a higher charge for hurting someone. Uh, taking a wallet by just bumping into someone and, and snatching it is way easier than taking a watch. So it's the wallet that I would worry about the most, especially because if they get your credit cards and have enough time, they can do a lot. They can generate a lot more money than they could off of most people's watches. Another thing is a lot of uh, a lot of thieves in general don't know anything about luxury watches, which is good and bad. It's good in the sense that, you know, being targeted for your watch may be less likely than being targeted for your wallet. I would assume that's probably statistically backed up. The other thing is uh, I've also heard, at least historically, uh, like wearing a watch on a steel bracelet, that's a calling card, period. And so when people think oh, I'm going to wear my Pagini design so that I don't get robbed, at the distance, the thief doesn't know that it's not a real Nautilus. They just know it's a shiny watch. And so your wrist and your watch are just as much at risk that you wore a cheap one versus an expensive one. So, and the likelihood of you being shot for your watch doesn't change based off of the brand. So if that's the issue, then wearing a watch, period, puts you at more risk than anything else. So. I mean, it's all it's you know, it's all that sort of stuff. I uh, I honestly don't really think too much about uh, theft crime like that. Uh, any of my watches that are a thousand U.S. dollars or more are insured. So if someone wanted to steal the watch, I wouldn't make a stink about it. Um, but you know, if they're trying to take it off of you, there's always a risk for your health. But that same risk exists if you carry money, and practically everyone has to carry money. So. There's always my point being there's always a risk that you could get mugged, I guess. So I never really thought of it in the realm of I see some people on forums absolutely obsess over it. And I wonder if they just are really fearful people or if it's really that dangerous because it seems a bit excessive to me. But again, I don't I don't live in an area which is associated with high watch crime. We have crime, uh, but that crime is not usually oriented around what people wear in terms of jewelry or timepieces or whatnot. So like what Tuna here is saying, they have specialist gangs in London from Pakistan, et cetera, on the lookout for luxury watch wear. See, that's very different than around here where most thefts are like catalytic converters to get the precious metals out of those, for example. And Von Krill uh, sort of echoes that. It's very organized. They train their guys to spot valuable pieces. Well, that's very interesting um, and very unfortunate. So in those regards, I would recommend if you're looking at luxury courts, maybe look more at the citizen uh, lineup or the Longines and not the FP Journe. How about that? Why not both? No, don't buy both guys. Don't buy the Citizen and the FP Journe. That's just too much quartz. Is there such a thing? I'll tell you, they, the only issue I have with too much quartz is changing all the batteries. And that's after changing those two dozen watches. I was like, this is too much quartz. We got to, let's pull all the stems out and stop the watches and save the battery life so that we don't have to do this again in two years. That's the trick. Uh, and that's actually what I do with my, uh, my, um, Mr. Jones watch my step right up uh, quartz piece. I, uh, well, maybe I don't, I, I need to check it again, but I, I tend to keep the stem out because uh, I got that watch uh, as a gift and the battery died like within two months because the watch had been two years old at that point. Not surprising, but uh, so I changed the battery and I was like, you know what? I only wear this watch to like pinball conventions. I don't think I need to keep it running. I know that's sort of the point of quartz, but it's a novelty watch. I don't wear it all. So anyway, uh, that's it for today's live stream. Again, I've got the relevant links. Uh, if you guys want to, uh, the Discord has been fairly active. So if you want to have fun with the chatting, go ahead and click on the Discord link. There's no cost. It's free. Uh, it's all, I got it all figured out and opened up now. We got some, we got channels for Seiko. We got channels for Rolex. I don't have a channel just for Quartz. I've done it more by brand, but we can do a Quartz channel. It's easy. And I I figured out enough about Discord over the years to know how to kind of manage one. So uh, feel free to do that. It's real easy to, to use from your phone or your computer. And it's way easier than ch chatting on YouTube. And so like YouTube comment section, I love comments. Don't get me wrong. And they help the videos, but 
you don't actually have a conversation. Discord is, works a lot better. You guys can share photos on it. It's uh, and it's portable, and that's what I like about it. So, so those are the main things there. Uh, I do want to point out uh, Von Kroll's comment here about I do favor solar quartz, but there's also some cool pieces that aren't solar. So I had to make peace with battery changes. Yeah, solar quartz. I'm a uh, and that's where again the uh, the solar beat from Cartier and how I want it in the Santos. That's where that's coming from, and that's why when it comes to wearing quartz, I wear my G-Shock. Partly because the novelty stuff right up watch is very difficult to read the time on, especially in a darkened environment. G-Shock, I'm recharging it when I'm outside. It, once or twice a year, I'll go ahead and have it reconnect to the, because it's when it's in the watch box, it, it can't ever sync up to the radio to, to update, but it's accurate enough. And, and I, you know, I go ahead and get the few seconds that it's off corrected a couple times a year by setting it near a window frame and telling it, go ahead and sync. Uh, so I really... Because of that, though, I'm so spoiled from that G-Shock uh, being solar powered and not, you know, having had it for years and not worried about a battery change yet that I just I really like. And that's where like Citizen and EcoDrive and stuff, they catch my eye more because I'm like, you know what, just put it in the sun or wear it outside once in a while or wear it inside for a full day. And uh, it does pretty well. So that's sort of that's I I really like solar very much. So uh, I'm a I'm a and when it comes to quartz, I'm a solar fanboy probably be the best way to say it and scott says tag has a nice solar offering in the aqua racer i'll have to look into it because i have not explored that i've liked some of the new shape designs like what they're doing with the dial configurations on the aqua racers tag is not a brand i've ever owned and it's not a brand i've looked at it from time to time but it's never clicked for me the newer aqua racers i do like but <sighs> the problem is i'm not the biggest dive. I, I say i'm not the biggest dive watch person as i've added more and more dive watches but um, it's just not good. probably going to be next on the list, but, um, but I've considered it. I've considered getting something else, a solar that isn't the G-Shock because the G-Shock is like my industrial, like do everything. When I mow, I wear the G-Shock. If I go biking, I wear the G-Shock. Uh, a lot of times when I go out for walks, I'll wear the G-Shock because I have no qualms about sweating in it. Incidentally, if you do have a G-Shock, one of the things I, I would recommend for you, uh, it, it's a bit of a pain to, to do the swap, but get a get an adapter so you can wear right you can wear regular straps and then you like get some silicon and stuff and uh it's because I, I the resin straps okay i thought it was okay but i actually got an adapter kit from barton bands because they're pretty cheap and i got a silicon strap for it it's way more comfortable on the barton way more comfortable and you know it's still got all that resiliency about you can just like run it under the sink and wash the sweat and salt off of it. If you're like me, that's what it is. Get coated in white salt from all the sweat. And uh, it's just so much softer and more comfortable. Uh, you can lay the watch flat. One of my most annoying things about those resin bands with those G-Shocks is they don't lay flat. Um, so I got the adapter for the squares, at least for the squares. So uh, I, I highly recommend it. I don't, it doesn't have to be Barton. I, I'm not partial to any brand in particular, but they're pretty affordable. So I would really much, uh, I would really suggest it. Uh, let's see. Scott's asks, uh, state of the collection coming? You've made a lot of moves within the collection, it appears. Um, no. I I mean, well, I guess it, I, I'm more than willing to hear your guys' feedback. I've always done the state of collection in November. So, and I've never wanted to be one of those YouTube people because, quite frankly, straight of the state of the collection videos get a lot of views. But I'm not wanting to be one of those like, let's do the spring update to the state of the collection so I can get 10,000 easy views, uh, as fun as it might be. Uh, so I've always only done it because I've done two of them. I've always done it in November because that's when I started. So my plan had been to wait a few more months and then do it in the fall um, when I've always done it. And then, yeah, and then point out the point out all the moves at that point. Because uh, I don't I haven't picked up anything this year that I've then gotten. I thought about accelerating it if I got something and then was about to get rid of it again, but I've not really done that in that in this period. So, so yes, Scott, the state of collection video is coming. I do absolutely people do like them a lot. They do very well on YouTube, and I get it. I love watching them too. I'll sit there and watch people that all they own are Seikos, and I'll just be like, this is so weird, but it's interesting to me because they think so differently. Like I, I, I could never just go all in on one brand. So it's fascinating to hear someone's thought process. So I really like state of the. I like watching them. Uh, but that's when I do them is in the fall. So, yes, I I am I am uh, gonna do it. I'll probably do it like the last year as well. Where I'll point out everything in the state of the collection twenty twenty two that's not in my possession anymore. Um, and then I might have to point out. I think my 
Glashuta original I might have gotten after I did that video, and then that one I did since get rid of. So I might have to just throw in some footage of the ones that didn't make the state of the collection because uh, they didn't last long enough. Anyway, that is it for this weekend. I don't know what the next pre-recorded schedule will be, but I will plan to, as I have been very consistently, uh, trying to do these, uh, what are for me, Saturday morning live streams. So uh, feel free, if you're on the Discord, uh, there's a whole topic suggestion area. Let me know what you guys want in terms of another uh, another topic for these, because if there's not anything like newsworthy, sometimes I use these live streams to just talk about the news. Uh, of stuff that I don't feel like putting a full pre-recorded video together on, but other times we just need a topic like we did today. Like, well, let's just talk quartz. Let's talk luxury quartz. I sure as, sure as hell never had before. So it was, you know, I think it was a, a fun, meaningful one. Hopefully those of you who watched it recorded uh, have found it useful, but uh, that's it for today. I will talk to you all on the next one. See ya.